Welcome to the Health Revolution. This is Clive Takal welcoming you to another edition. And today I'm very pleased to welcome Keith Foster. And uh, I discovered Keith because of my interest in C60. And while Keith has got a lot more to speak about than just C60, I'm hoping, Keith, we can start there. <laughs> Absolutely. Everybody knows that life on this planet is carbon-based. But until about 12 years ago, we didn't know which carbon. There were several variables. And then, as I say, about 12 years ago, some American scientists were looking into the composition of dark stars deep in space when using spectrometry. And they isolated or discovered this particular form of carbon which has taken over my life, and it's called C60. C60 because it's made up of 60 atoms, each of which is connected to the other, making a geodesic dome, or like a football, and it has quite unusual electrical properties. The notion that there are different types of carbon is probably quite a novel one to you, but uh, we've known for a long time that we are a carbon-based life form. We just didn't know which carbon. And in discovering C60, a very, very stable carbon molecule in deep space, that became a candidate for what makes us. Science moves at its own speed, and it took several years for the information on the dark star to reach a Japanese group who were doing some research into different structures of carbon. And they discovered that C60, which is the dominant form of charcoal of carbon that I'm interested in, uh, existed on Earth in abundance in hardwood. This knowledge took a further five or six years to get around the world to Europe, and it became a subject of substantial interest because it's a very stable carbon molecule. Um, unlike many other forms of carbon, diamonds, soot, graphite, and so forth, it was very hard and very, very stable. Now, diamond is hard, but with a hydrogen coating, so it's too hard to be used in any life function. Um, that is to say, the life functions that keep us alive, not those that cheer us up. Um, graphite is a series of planes which flake off, so that's not of any particular use unless you're drawing with a pen, a pencil, I mean. Um, Soot, I suppose, is a form of carbon, but it's, it's too fine to be any use for anything in medicine or anything else. So <clears throat> we were left with this open question about which carbon are we based upon? And as the research went on, it was discovered that we, in fact, are based upon carbon C60 because its stability, because of its ability to... Uh, its electromagnetic abilities, um, because of its hardness, and because it's abundant in nature. Our diet is underpinned, to a certain extent, by taking in quantities of carbon, and we separate out the C60 for use within our bodies. It has a whole variety of uses, met uses metabolically. I, along with a great many other people, started to look at <clears throat> why is it so electromagnetically um, functional, and how, in fact, did we come to use it in, in the first place, or, or to become habituated to its use in the first place. And I went back to the cave paintings in Lascaux in southern France, and, in fact, cave paintings around the world, where they've used charcoal, black, to outline bison and horses and a variety of other animals before using the iron red ochre to colour them. This charcoal was dominantly hardwood, and I couldn't figure out why, because there are plenty of other forms of wood about softwood and so forth, but hardwood seemed to be the preferred um, illustrative tool. The reason it transpired was that they were, they used to make the weapons of wood and turn it in the fire to harden it. 
And incidentally, that, that's a bit of a sidetrack, but they, up, up until recently, uh, mariners in sailing ships used to char the inside of barrels to make the water last longer and stay sweeter. Farmers used to char posts they were putting in the ground because they lasted longer. And they used to build structures, sheds and so forth, barns and so forth, out of charred, out of charred timber because it lasted longer. If you've ever been through a forest after there's been a fire, you'll see lots of um, blackened stumps. They don't rot. They're there for years and years and years. They're not susceptible to bacteria. They're not susceptible to virus. They're not particularly susceptible to uh, fungus. I'll come back to that. And that is because they're sheathed in charcoal. So charcoal has got some amazing antibacterial, antiviral, antiprion properties. Taking those properties to one side, the medical profession in, in, its, um, in its inquiring mode began to look at the possibility of using these charcoals um, for health purposes. One of the ways they've done this uh, is to exploit a discovery made in the late 19th century that charcoal would be a good fixative for paint and things like that. And being on the verge or in, in the middle of the Industrial Revolution, they wanted to ch charcoal everything uh, in vast quantities so that it could be sold as a, as a, as a product of industry. I can't put it any higher than that because I can't think of the words. But the result was activated charcoal. Now, this is a charcoal which has been cooked at 1,000 degrees or more and has and it's usually made out of scrap timber or pallets or sometimes coconut shells or bamboo or whatever you can lay your hands on that's um, vegetable-based. They cook it at over 1,000 degrees, then they acid wash it. So what you end up with is a superabsorbent, which will grab anything. Superabsorbents super have their role, believe me. In medicine, they have a particularly good role. If you have a drug overdose, they take you into hospital and they hydrate you with uh, activated charcoal. That takes the drugs out of your system and you get better. The use of a superabsorbent in your body over long periods of time is contraindicated in the nth degree because it competes at the cell wall for nutrient, with the nutrients. So you're not getting as much out of your food as you should if you're filled up with a supernutrient. Anyway, leaving that aside and going back to the cavemen, their diet was 80% very high vitamin C. In other words, leaves, shoots, roots, um, nuts. Everything they could gain was gained by the women of the tribe and eaten by everybody. And as you know from your, yourselves, if you eat a lot of green stuff quickly, you get flatulent. So imagine living in a cave with 20 or 30 other members of your extended family or tribe, and you're all breaking wind very regularly. You would soon discover that by chewing a bit of charcoal from the fire, the wind factor dropped. So you could eat all the green stuff you liked and not get tummy ache. The wind wouldn't be rumbling around inside you, it would be absorbed by the charcoal and taken out of you. Big leap forward for culinary practices in the caveman's age. <laughs> <laughs> so, moving it up to date, having found that this C60 has amazing properties, it was discovered that one of these properties is its antiviral capability. The second is its bacteriological capability, antibacteriological. And third was its ability to... Um, Alkalized systems, and the reason I say alkalize is that toxins, acidic toxins, uh, have more hydrogen atoms than oxygen. As a consequence, they become acidic. C60 has a particular function. It absorbs acidic toxins. It doesn't absorb them into itself, it binds them to its external structure. The mechanism for that is what they call 
van der Waal forces. These are little forces made up of positive and negative charges which cover the surface. And they naturally have a tendency to grip onto positively charged particles. Now, positive charges are made acidic by an abundance of hydrogen atoms. So the more hydrogen um, a substance contains, the more acidic it is. The fact that C60 has an affinity for, for acidic toxins means that it's very, very useful in detoxing people. Beyond that, it has a great application in medicine because by rendering the blood, the body in its entirety, slightly more alkaline, it enables the immune system to work better. An alkalized immune system prevents or keeps in balance the degree of um, infection that you may or may not have in your body. Therefore, the great goal of modern medicine is to have a high level of alkaline going through the body so as to keep it properly in balance. And it's interesting that um, beyond the age of about 40, there's a lady in uh, San Diego, I think, who's discovered that our alkaline levels as a species fall off quite dramatically. So from 40 onwards, we're much more prone to heart disease, cancer, and all of the modern diseases which we succumb to because we're less alkaline. So if you can increase your level of alkalinity naturally, and I say naturally I'm talking about using the C60 process, then you're going to live longer and live more healthy. That's a given. The, what's led me to this conclusion is my own example. I'm 76 now, and I'm fairly rhythmic because I take quite a bit of charcoal each evening with a glass of water and in the morning I pass it out and I feel great because there are no acidic toxins, or not many acidic toxins, knock on wood, accumulating in my body. And I've been doing that for some time. I've recently discovered that it also helps to take heavy metals out of the body, which is enormously useful therapeutically. So going back to the dog on the couch, which we weren't talking about, but we will now, you'd be sitting watching television, your dog will break wind and the room will empty of humans because it's so bad. So in Victorian times, they started to feed charcoal capsules to dogs. And people realised that they worked so well to repress wind and so forth, that they started taking charcoal, uh, charcoal biscuits. They're still around. The company that used to make them in the UK is still around, they're still in business, clinging to the surface of the medical profession, I imagine. But the, the true pioneering work has been done by Swiss teams, and French teams. French used it way back in the 1920s, and they had a very, very good veterinary report on the use of charcoal in uh, foot and mouth disease, which proved to be extremely useful. They didn't follow down that path because along came conflict, then we needed penicillin and things like that. So the use of these, what began as very ancient medicaments, and have been researched and proven to be very valuable 21st century medicaments, uh, ha has been suppressed. Quite frankly, we don't get told of the benefits of taking cheap, simple remedies. And that's a big problem in our society. If somebody in the circuit of health, and you, is making a lot of money, he, she or it is not going to stop doing that because it's immoral. They're going to go on charging you lots and lots for things that don't work terribly well. I'm here to tell you that charcoal, based upon the molecule C60, which has some amazing properties, can only do you good. And anybody tells you otherwise, doesn't know the science or is a charlatan. You need to take responsibility for your own health and you need to look at the fundamentals of health, which are toxicity, acidic toxicity, and poor nutrition. That's about all I've got to say. And um, could you explain how 
C60 is an adsorbing material as opposed to an absorbing <coughs> ad as opposed to ab. Well, OK. If you get a flannel towel and soak it in water, that absorbs the water. It soaks it up. If you um, have an acidic compound full of rampant bacteria and so forth, and you put, it, uh, you put some charcoal in it, it bonds to the surface. It doesn't go inside the charcoal, it bonds to the surface electromagnetically. And that's quite important because uh, charcoal's a fairly hard substance and taking it in, you want to be taking it in in a ground form. You don't want to be chewing off lumps of shungite or anything like that. You want to be pound it up and take it in uh, a one to two millimetre size because that's about the size that will suit human beings best. So absorb, sucks it in, adsorb, fixes it to the surface, and then you excrete it. So if you absorbed it, you'd absorb it through your stomach lining, through your lungs and so forth, and conceivably it wouldn't do you that much good. I don't know, I'm just speculating here, but what is certain is that charcoal with a, with a reasonably small one mil particle size, if it's sourced from an abundance of C60 bearing timber or from shungite, which is a naturally caring form under the earth, then that will work extremely well to help you stay healthy. I'm not saying it cures anything, because I can't prove that it does and I can't prove that it doesn't. But it will help your body to fight infection. And my product, which is called Happy Tummy Charcoal, does just what it says on the tin. Gives you a happy tummy. The stomach is the main organ of your body which keeps you healthy, keeps you ticking over. Your lungs, your kidneys and everything are vital, so is your brain. But if you can't, if you can't digest food properly, and if you can't get the nutrients you need out of food, you're as good as dead. And you're well on the way. And um, so the charcoal is sort of roughly ground. That there are people online selling pure C60 as nanoparticles. How safe do you think it is to absorb nanoparticles into the cells? Uh, I, don't think, I don't think it's very safe. The reason I say that is um, you tend not to get nanoparticles in nature, so you don't want to be tampering around with them anyway. But... If you put that on your skin, it tattoos. So it's going into the skin and staying there. Now, if you breathed it in, you'd be in hospital a bit lively because it'll choke you. It'll, it'll fill up the uh, a aeolian, whatever they're called, in your lungs. If you breathe in when you're drinking... It, it, sorry, if you breathe in, in a charcoal-rich in a, in a nanoparticle-rich atmosphere, there's every good chance it will clog your lungs up. If you take it in a capsule form and it's really, really fine nanoparticles, I suspect, and I'm not sure about this, that it will go through the stomach lining and through the intestine. And I'm not entirely sure you want absorbent particles full of toxins building up in your respiratory system or your... Uh, system of blood veins and, and um, arteries. I'm a little vague on that, and I do apologise, but nobody's ever asked me that before, so I've never thought through an answer, but it's just common sense. If it ain't in nature, don't use it. So, um, assuming we avoid activated charcoal, because it's mm -hmm. taking out the good stuff as well as the bad, mm -hmm. if we're taking a natural form of charcoal such as yours, are there any risks involved? Could one take too much, for example? Well, you'd have a job because it's, it's difficult enough to take as it is. We put it in a vegetable capsule so that people can wash it down. And I always find I need a piece of biscuit or a piece of fruit afterwards to get it down because it's very light, it floats. And these things float to the surface. Um, I think it's very important to make sure you're getting it from a reputable source. Make sure that it isn't contaminated in the processing, because that can happen so easily. I mean, we were offered an awful lot of charcoal some time ago when we were a bit short of the good stuff, and we sent it off to the lab, as we do with every batch, and they came back and said, not fit for human consumption because it's, it's absorbed all sorts of um, petroleum-based products from the environment. 
you've got to be really careful when you're recommending something to help people with their health, that it is helping them and not importing toxins at the same time. And charcoal is very absorbent, adsorbent. In a previous conversation, you were saying that the charcoal that you provide is from very deep-rooted hardwood trees. Yes, you see, in every structure, like a tree, that's been chopped up and carbonised, charcoalised, um, there are elements of what was in the soil where the tree was growing. And we source our charcoal really carefully. It is the main priority to get from a deep-rooted source that's never been sprayed and is very, very tough, very thick, very, very densely grained timber. Most hardwoods are slightly toxic. So when you are achieving the, the carbon state, you're driving off the toxins and it becomes oxygen-hungry, so it really soaks in oxygen. Now, the reason, the reason, just to recapitulate, the reason we go for a very deep source, or deep-rooted source, is that plants put down deep roots to find the minerals they need to grow, to grow properly, to grow healthy. And it's that search for minerals, which is part of our lives as well. We need to have the right balance of minerals in our lives. And nature doesn't provide that too easily in a modern forest which is open to all manner of toxins, particularly nowadays, where they spray the fields with hideous varieties of poison, killing all the wildlife, killing all the bugs, killing all the moths and the caterpillars, and most of all, killing all the bees, so they can produce a perfect-looking product, which is very poor in nutrients, very poor in vitamins, and really, it's possibly quite toxic over a period of time. Take charcoal every day and you'll offset that. that that's me plugging my product. <laughs> so, so how much could one offset um, glyphosate, for example, around us, Monsanto? I mean, you know, how, how much charcoal would you have to take to get it out and how much might you succeed? I haven't done the research. I can't say accurately. I can only say rule of thumb that I would, if I got like a phosphate going on in the atmosphere around me, I would take quite a lot of charcoal. How many is quite a lot? Ten capsules. In one day or? Oh, yeah. You know, would you take ten with each meal, for instance, or just ten? Well, you once could. It does no harm. Yeah. Um, I take four every evening with a glass of water, I think I mentioned. But if I'd been in a particularly poisonous environment, I'd certainly take 10. So London, for example? Yes, yeah. London. Oh, OK. Breathing in not only all the dioxides and all the filthy gases that we create, but breathing in high levels of radiation. People don't realise that they suck oil out of the ground where there is radon gas, refine it, doesn't take out the radon gas, burn it in your car, and the exhaust pumps out radon gas. Hmm. Radioactive. So charcoal would be a counter to radioactivity? Not per se, but in the sense that it takes out the carriers. So, sorry, you've lost me there. It takes out the carriers. Yeah, you see, <clears throat> a gas like radon plates onto the nearest particle. So if you're getting uh, a lot of particulates into your lungs, which you are in London, then a hyper, well, quite a high proportion of that, depending on fuel, will have radon plated onto it. Things that plague the average person who isn't looking after the health properly, they're not getting the nutrients they need, they've got sort of brain fog maybe, they've got aches and pains. Mm. Would the C60 charcoal have any effect on those sort of day-to-day -day Absol factors? Absolutely. Let's look at the average person's health. During the course of the first 40 years, they absorb toxins like a sponge. Everything that we eat is processed. Everything that we touch is manufactured in some way. It all has its own relationship with toxins. 
And as I say, by the time you're 40, when your uh, alkalinity starts to decline, uh, by the way, the researcher was called Dr. Linda Frasetto, San Diego, a very, very clever bit of research. Um, as your ability to throw these things off declines, they catch up with you. So during the course of your life, you're accumulating toxins, you're accumulating poisons, you're breathing in car fumes, you're breathing in cigarette smoke, you're breathing in a whole variety of chemicals, uh, not, not forgetting glycophosphate and similar utter poisons. And they're also putting them on your food. I mean, an apple from the fields has been sprayed 14 times by the time it reaches the shelves. Um, wheat, grain, the stuff of life, has been genetically modified and sprayed dozens of times before with antifungals, anti all sorts of stuff, before it gets to you. So you take it in and they say, oh, well, the, the amounts are so tiny they don't count. They accumulate in your body. And as they accumulate, you start getting the aches and pains and, the, you know, the mind fog and all this kind of thing. It is a process. Now, if you can delay that process or eradicate it by taking C60, or vitamin, sorry, by taking um, the charcoal C60, that will bull, buttress you against slow toxicity. And that's probably the most important thing to say to camera today, that we are made of C60. That is the basic molecule of life with all its wonderful complexity and wonderful electromagnetic properties, which I haven't gone into, but could, it is the structural molecule of all life on Earth, as far as we know. We assume all life is carbon-based. So, to supplement that molecule's activity by alkalizing your system, using what nature provided for that purpose, which is charcoal, C60 charcoal, not messed about charcoal. <laughs> not charcoal that's been subjected to a process, but charcoal that's been honestly arrived at, carefully analysed, screened and made absolutely sure that it contains no toxins whatsoever. You can put that in your system and you will feel better. And you will probably get better. And if you have a long-term illness, a debilitating long-term illness, take a long-term cure. Take charcoal. It'll take the toxins from the illness out of your bloodstream and it will begin to alter the pH, that is the acid-alkaline balance in your bloodstream, favourably toward the alkaline, so that you will get less ill. And on average, somebody takes the C60 charcoal, how, how long does it usually take before they tell you, oh, I noticed something? A couple of weeks. Right, okay. A couple of weeks, people come with terrible tummy ache, with a whole spectrum of tummy related diseases, which I'm not allowed to specify, um, and they come back cured. I'm not, I'm sorry, they come back feeling a lot better, and they're able to carry on living normal lives much better through having taken this amazing substance. And it is amazing, isn't it? Yeah. And, I mean, it's inexpensive as well, which is very pleasing. Harmless, inexpensive. Effective. Tasteless. Yeah. Odourless. Mm. They, they used to put it in gas masks to stop you getting gassed in the First World War. And that the, the gases would have been chlorine? Mostly chlorine, yeah. yeah. Mustard gas, chlorine. So it, we're all... We're all taking in chlorine just from having a bath. Well, that's right. Uh, or a shower. Do you, do you think that the charcoal would be removing some of that chlorine? Quite possibly, because a lot gets through the skin into the bloodstream. So quite possibly. I can't say definitely yes, but I would be surprised if it didn't. Yeah. So uh, over the last few years, you must have seen some pretty incredible results. Absolutely. What, what, what's really stuck in your mind? Lady who threw away her crutches and went dancing. Another lady who went rifle shooting and dancing. I'm not sure the two were... Not at the same time, necessarily. I... <laughs> I'm not sure they were compatible activities, but... Um, people's hair has grown back. Not, not from the state of being bald, but their hair, when it was grey, has now gone back to being chestnut. Mm. 
people who have reclaimed their lives are able to go to work again and not ridden with appalling tummy problems. It really does help enormously. It's cheap, it's available, it's effective, and it's common sense, really. Yeah. I'm fortunate in having a wonderful wife, and her hobby for the last 40 odd years has been gardening. She's very, very good at it. She's from a different country, one where insect bites are ferocious, and on our first honeymoon, I romantically took her to Scotland on a fishing holiday, where she met Scottish midges and was bitten to bits. So I was then charged with come up with something which will stop insect bites. Reasoning it through, I thought, well, the insects don't bite for fun, they bite for a purpose. That purpose is that the bull can need a blood meal in order to produce their eggs. And they obtained this from people or animals who sweat sweetness. Now, your, your perspiration may not taste very sweet to you, but I assure you it does to an insect. And with horses, there's something called sweet itch, which is caused by insect bites. So I thought, if I can turn that against them and produce a product that doesn't harm the human or the creature that I'm putting it on, is natural and has that ability to prevent insects from biting, then I've cracked it. And what I did was I got all the old um, manuals about different um, herbal remedies for bites and insects attack and so forth, and I picked out three or four of these quite strong herbs, soaked them for a period of time, and filtered them, and came up with this fly spray. Now, if you're gardening and you get bitten, put this on. If you're going fishing, take some with you. Any circumstances where you're going to meet insect bites, be it fleas or horse flies or midges or whatever, this will deter them, because when they go to bite, this, because this is so bitter, it locks up the biting mechanism, which is acid-driven, therefore it's sweet. It locks the biting mechanism and they go away. In concentrated form, it also prevents them breeding. So it's a very good thing to use on a regular basis. But we can't go on killing things indiscriminately with enormously strong pesticides because they accumulate in us. So we've got to find better ways of doing it. And the best way is the way the nature does it, the way that nature does it. And that is to produce herbs which produce in themselves substances to prevent insects attacking them. That's yeah, right, yeah very good. Very good. And so that's a really big bottle that's going to last quite a while, isn't it? <laughs> yes. If you're outside every day and there were, were lots of midges around, how long might that last you? A couple of months, maybe? Or oh, at least. Yeah. yeah, three or four months. You don't have to put a lot on. No. So maybe, maybe a summer season or something. Uh, yeah. Um, I can imagine all sorts of scenarios where bugs get at you anyway. Mm. I mean, if we're importing stuff in containers, bugs get in. And Probably. Presume, presumably it's safe from a... It's not going to stain your well, you clothes or anything? You can swallow it. It tastes horrible. Yeah. It, I mean, if you're wearing something white and you, it, it's sprayed on your sleeve or something, it's not I've never tried. <laughs> well, I'm sure if it did make stains, you would have known. I would have known about it, yes. I imagine used over a period of time it would build up, but you just wash it properly, you know. You shouldn't wash stuff too often anyway. But it tastes awful. Mm. But it does keep the bugs away. Right, very good. There we are. If you're an outdoor person, you're likely in the winter or in the wet weather to get your hands chapped. If you're a horse rider, you're particularly going to get your hands chapped hacking out in the winter time or the autumn, or in the spring in wet weather. Um, it's where the skin dries out, gets cracked. It's very unpleasant. Gardeners suffer from it as well, particularly very hands-on gardeners, like Monty Don and people like that. Um, chapped skin, chapped hands. 
looked at that as a problem and thought, what can we do to prevent that? And I found a way of deeply protecting the skin. And I'll read you out the ingredients, because some of them are difficult to get. Aromatic beeswax. Bees have been here for 63 million years, so they must be doing something right. Olive oil. Olive oil has been here since way back. Rose geranium. Glorious smell and very, very good medicinal properties. Margosa. Cape lilac, in other words, which is neem. A form of neem, which is hard to get hold of in the right quantity. Tajet, which is very good for building the skin. Parsley oils which are really good antiviral and antibiotic, and zinc oxide, very well known as a skin uh, rejuvenator, strengthener, whatever. This is the cream it makes. It smells lovely, that's the rose geranium. It works like a charm, and you can use it on your face, on your hands, anywhere you like. It will prevent insect infestation because your skin will be much healthier. It will prevent your skin cracking. It will prevent it drying out. And it will overall make your skin much more healthy. So that's it. It's called Skin Deep because that's as deep as it goes. And is there any risk that after using it, your body produces less of its own emollients and you then become reliant on <clears> that? We've never found that to be the case. It was used widely in Scandinavia when we first brought it out as a test. And people with enormously chapped hands were getting better and then staying better, possibly because it had gone into the dry season. But it wouldn't replace the natural sebaceous gland exclusions. Uh, it, it wouldn't do that. It's safe. I've eaten it on toast just to prove <laughs> it's safe. <laughs> I'm still here. Um, <clears throat> always test things on yourself. And, no, I don't think there's any, there's any downside to it at all. It's just a really, really good hand cream. And how quickly is it likely to work? I mean, it's got really chapped skin, it's really nasty. How well, fast does it regrow? I mean, that depends a lot on diet and the state of their health and so forth, to how fast it will, their skin will regrow. Normally, though, because it's, it's covered, and it's, got, it's fairly thick stuff, um, well, not really quite nice. Um, a week, you know. And for them to... F but they're presumably going to feel sort of instant pain relief. Oh, yeah. Them. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, I've got my face chapped here, so I'm putting a bit on now. Uh, yes, you, you do feel... Well, because your, uh, the, the, the underside of your skin isn't in touch with the atmosphere, because it's got a layer of this on it, then it obviously starts to get better quite quickly. Right. And the beeswax obviously contains a lot of what honey contains. And honey is notorious for fighting bacteria. So really, it's, it's, uh, you're, get, you're getting several benefits that are hidden in the formulation. Works like a charm. One of the great scourges of our society today is arthritis. We all eat lots of sugar and lots and lots of trace elements in our food and it adds up to acid around our joints. As these joints acidify, they become painful, swollen, red, and it's extremely uncomfortable. And this, happy joints, will help you to get rid of it. Happy joints contains turmeric, a herb which was originally developed and discovered in India in Arathrovedic medicine and then used very widely in Yunani medicine, which is the Arab form of medicine which came originally from Greece. Yunani means Greek. Um, Hippocrates and people like that. Turmeric is an anti-inflammatory. So when it gets around your joints, it reduces the inflammation. Um, arthritis is largely inflammation caused by over-acidity. So, the turmeric gets in and it reduces the acidity to some degree and it helps enormously with the pain. Now, it's difficult taking turmeric by itself in sufficient quantity. 
So what I've done here with Happy Joints is I've mixed it with ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C, because vitamin C is one of the few things produced by nature which will desaturate protein, allowing an electron flow. In other words, it helps your immune system to work better. Now, with the vitamin C, I've mixed citrus bioflavonoids because vitamin C by itself doesn't work. You've got to have bioflavonoids. In the normal course of events, I would use rose hips, but in this case, I use citrus because it was more compatible. Then finally, there's disodium tetraborate, borax to you. Borax is absolutely wonderful for alkalizing um, around your joints. By alkalizing it, it reduces, it, by alkalizing them, it reduces the acidity, which reduces the inflammation. People who have tried this, and it has been on test for a long time, because we wanted a big background of people saying how good it was, only to discover that we're not allowed to publish that. However, people who have tried it have thrown away their crutches, have gone dancing, have started to run again, have started to be able to use their computer keyboards again, have started to have a lot more movement in their joints again. It works. It works like a charm. It doesn't work for everybody. It's not a miracle cure, far from it. It is a feed additive supplement which will help your body recover. That's all you can say about it, really. It works. And do you feel that um, magnesium is another important component? I think it's vital, yes, I really do. So, so is there magnesium in that, or there do you is, recommend? There is, there is not a lot. So do you recommend people take magnesium additionally? I do, yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would as well. Yeah, it was, it was uh, an oversight on my part that magnesium didn't get put in this, but since we ran off a few thousand, I thought, well, just put a little note in saying use with magnesium. That works. Um, it's not a curless mixture. None of the things that we make are curless. They're all tested on us and our children and our friends and wider circles of people, all of whom are still living happy, arthritis-free lives. <laughs> there, there, are, there, are, there are curative tendencies in all of nature. Nature does nothing without a sound purpose. I think it was Archimedes who said that it might have been Socrates, but it was one of the Greeks. Nature does nothing without a good purpose. So we try and piggyback on that good purpose and make it work slightly better and apply it where people have got the common sense to see that if I eat this kind of stuff, it's going to have this effect on me. Whereas if I eat it and take this, it will reduce that effect. But if I stop eating muck, then it won't translate into, into, into ill health. And if I take the right kind of supplements initially to prevent ill health, I'm quids in. And how long would, for the average person who has got joint pain, how long would that last? Three times a day with food, that'll last you six to eight weeks. Right, okay. That'll see you right. You'll be noticing a substantial mending in the first month. Do you find anybody notices the difference in the first week, say? People get enthusiastic about the, the littlest of things. I, I'm reluctant to say yes to that, and I'm reluctant to say no, because there have been people who say, oh, it's an magic charm and all this sort of thing, but not for everybody. So we're trying to get everybody to try it who's got arthritis. Right, very good. Um, you know, you try and strike a balance between commerce and morality. Yeah. And that's the wonderful thing about magnesium. Um, I do find, particularly if you give it to somebody who's got some serious joint issues mm. uh, as a magnesium oil spray, that and they rub it in a lot, yeah. uh, they often report uh, that the pay, pain is reduced in literally minutes. I'm sure, because that's going on topically. Yeah. yeah. I find that similarly with people who filled the bath with it and jumped in. Oh, yeah. They feel a lot better. If you use enough, I mean, a lot of people don't use enough. No. They'll use really a minimum of half a kilo. Yeah, half a kilo or so, um, or plus, yeah. And, of course, you make wonderful mixtures of some of those, you know, magnesium chloride mixed with bicarbonate of soda, mixed with Epsom salts. 
Um, I'm a big fan of bicarbonate of soda, as you know, yeah. uh, for different reasons, but uh, yes, absolutely. This is debug. If you're going abroad into an area where there's malaria, take some debug with you, because it frightens mosquitoes away. There's a ruffless mosquito that carries, well, not only malaria, but Zeta virus now, is, uh, is carried by mosquitoes. It's an airborne thing. Um, we discovered this when my son went out on holiday to Guyana and said the mosquitoes are, you could saw through them, there's so many, you know, huge numbers of mosquitoes rising up from where the old canals used to be. So we developed this, which has a fair old complement of neem in it, which has been used traditionally to um, to get rid of insect bites and uh, as an anti-malarial. We've boosted it with beeswax and zinc oxide and tajet, which once again is neem. Um, we seem to have hit upon a combination here which is particularly useful for people travelling in hot countries. But since malaria is not unknown in Europe, um, used to be called Walcheren fever in Napoleonic times. Since it's not unknown, it's as well to have some around the place if you're sleeping exposed. Uh, if you're, you're sleeping with the windows open on a hot summer's day and, and there's a lot of puddles around, there's a good chance you're going to be bitten. So use this. If you get bitten by a horsefly, which is a particularly nasty bite, use this. The pain goes almost immediately and it gets better quicker. If you break out in a rash because of insect bites, I'm not talking about a heat rash, I'm just talking about generally people get bitten and they have an allergic reaction, put this on. won't cure it, but it'll help, help dramatically. It's light, easy to carry, difficult to forget, and it doesn't give you psychoactive problems as do modern medicines against malaria. Mepocrine and what was the other one they used to use? Um, Lorem, something, I can't, I can't remember. Um, but you'd come back a bit skewed from the tropics. You don't want that. You really don't want to take these psychoactive things into your body. This is a natural product, and it's one that works. It contains natural ingredients and no preservatives. It doesn't need to because it's not going to, um, it's not going to come apart quickly. It's, it's very tightly bonded in with the beeswax. That's why we put that in there. And the zinc oxide, of course, is extremely good for the skin. But there's something about the neem tree which puts insects off. And what that is, I mentioned it earlier, it interferes with their breeding cycle. Mm. So um, their, their chelated exteriors cannot function properly. So they avoid it like the plague. And it's bitter, tastes horrible, but it works. If you get a bit in your mouth, you'll know what I'm talking about. But it really works to keep the bugs away. They've, they've learned over thousands of generations to avoid it. Well, very good. I wish I'd had that years ago when I, I had one night sleeping out in the desert. And I woke up about three in the morning, or I assume it was three, three o'clock in the morning. And I didn't know what had gone wrong. My eyes wouldn't open. Mm, sunfly fever. Uh, well, something had bitten me on the on the eyelids. Oh no! And it took me probably about two hours before I could open my eyes even a little bit. Or it seemed like two hours. Probably wasn't that long. Yeah. A frightening amount of time. Um, you know, I mean, I realised pretty quickly what was going on, but uh, they were after the moisture. It could be. Yeah. So they probably bit the lid just to make you go like that. Yes, it's possible. It's possible. Yeah, because we don't have that nictating membrane which a lot of uh, creatures do. How dreadful. Mm. You survived, anyway. I survived, thank you, yes. <laughs> yes. Useful that. Yeah. So well, there good. we go. Well, excellent. Thank you so much, Keith. That was very, That's very interesting. And uh, I, I will let you know how my clients get on. <laughs> Please do.